What are the terms and conditions of doing business with China? Western business executives off the record saying they're, quote, spooked by the arrest of two Canadian nationals in what's seen as retaliation for the extra extradition proceeding launched in Vancouver on December 1st against the chief financial officer of phone and tech giant Huawei. The charges pressed by the United States raise questions that go well beyond the current trade war with Beijing and the battle for tech supremacy. Now, we're on the eve of China's president, Xi Jinping, to ma making a major address from the Great Hall of the People to mark the 40th anniversary of Deng Xiaoping's decision to open up the economy. We would learn in time when Deng made that momentous decision that communism was indeed compatible with uh, China's brand of state-sponsored capitalism. But how about free trade and rule of law? Groups like Huawei coming under newfound scrutiny over their ties to China's security apparatus. Does the digital age boil down to a choice between playing by the rules of a China that's cracking down harder than ever on dissent and a Silicon Valley which stands accused of putting profits above all else? The two sides are rivals and they do business together. Where does that leave the rest of the world? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Beijing's brand of capitalism. And joining us from Oxford, historian Rana Mitter. He's the director of Oxford University's China Center. Thank you for speaking with us. Pleasure to be here. We'll be joined later by, uh, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, by Philippe Lecoll, senior fellow at Harvard, Harvard's uh, Kennedy School uh, uh, Belfer's Center. And with us here in the studio, Chun Yan Li, founder of Theta Consulting and the author of Succeeding in the Chinese yeah. Market. Welcome back yeah. to the show. Thank you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, the hashtag F24Debate. Canada's ambassador to China has uh, now had consular access to both business consultant Michael Spavor and former diplomat think tank researcher Michael Kovrig. Beijing, though, still calling on the U.S. to drop those charges against the daughter of the founder of Huawei, Meng Wanzhou, over alleged Iran sanctions violation. And uh, on Ottawa, they're, Beijing calling on Ottawa to let her fly home. The United States and Canada can continue to boast that they're abiding by the rule of law, but in my opinion, this is simply a modern version of the emperor's new clothes. No matter what excuse they use, they are displaying their ignorance of the facts and their contempt for the rule of law. They have become laughing stock of the world. Uh, Rana Mitter, were you surprised by... Uh, uh, this whole affair, it, it broke, remember, just as uh, Donald Trump at the G20 was having uh, dinner with uh, his Chinese counterpart. I was surprised by the immediate circumstances of the arrest, but I wasn't entirely surprised by the fact that the trade war between the United States and China has escalated. One of the most significant political developments in the last few months is the very clear indication from the Trump administration that they are focusing laser-like on China as a potential rival and even, in some ways, a sort of enemy. So this has seen the arrival and people of the administration like John Bolton, very hawkish national security advisor. It's also seen the arrival or the, the continuation of figures like Peter Navarro, trade advisor and Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. trade representative. All of these are people who have made it very clear that trying to put China back in the box, contain China, is a really important part of their strategy. And therefore, this particular arrest, this particular desire to try and push back against China at a time when it's perceived that China's leader, Xi Jinping, is on the back foot, is in a sense not all that surprising, but it is an escalation. Again, you know, prosecutors say, wait a minute, we're not banana republics. We don't take our orders from the executive, uh, uh, from, from the top. Uh, we didn't arrest her at this particular point in time for political reasons. What do you make of it? 
I think that that is, of course, literally true. Uh, and in fact, the reason the Canadians, of course, have clearly had to place her under arrest is that there is an extradition agreement between the United States and Canada, which argues that both sides respects the legal validity of each other's claims. But there's a wider issue. Think for a second about the issue on which Meng Wanzhou has been arrested. It is for the alleged, and we should say at the moment, of course, it is an allegation, the alleged busting of sanctions against Iran. Now, the fact is that people globally have seen that the United States is really trying to dismantle the previous agreement that the Obama administration made uh, with Iran on nuclear and other issues. And therefore, not everyone shares the view that busting Iran sanctions is necessarily something that the United States is able to order other states to do or not to do. So there is a question here, not just of the legal validity of the, uh, of the action, which may be indisputable, but whether or not there is a political aspect to it as well. And when it comes to Iran, everything is political. When it comes to Iran, everything is political. Chun Yan Li, yeah. what, what, are, what are the reactions that you're hearing okay. to, about this arrest? Yeah, so following the Huawei in, uh, in, uh, incident, uh, I have uh, been discussing with uh, some Chinese friends and also I have been through the comments on the Chinese uh, social networks. So uh, first of all, um, most of Chinese people, they, were, they have been uh, astonished uh, very surprised to learn this news, and uh, they have e expressed their incomprehension and also their anger. Uh, um, the reason that the, the question that they have been asking that why a Chinese citizen uh, who hasn't been living in the USA can be arrested in the third party country according to the American laws. So most of Chinese, um, especially in China, uh, they think that China, uh, the American arms are too long and then tend to control, you know, the, the rules uh, in, the, uh, in the world. Uh, and then I have also observed that there was um, some kind of national pride arising on the Chinese uh, uh, social networks because Huawei uh, has an um, amazing uh, development st uh, story. It has been uh, created only for around 30 years. And, uh, as Chinese, we are very pr uh, proud of this brand. And uh, they have great uh, technologies, very advanced technologies, and uh, people are working very hard. So for Chinese, it's very hard to accept that the CFO of Huawei uh, has been ar arrested. And then uh, from my point of view, um, I think, um, uh, you know, the the, the I know the USA has uh, the export control regulations and also have some international transaction uh, laws, but to what extent it can be you know, applied to Chinese citizens, there, there are still many details to be discussed. So I'm not going into the details, but in my point of view, what's really pity is that today, as mentioned, there's escalation. So you don't buy that justice is blind or that your friends say they, they don't think justice is blind. They think this is a witch hunt. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, for, for the Chinese uh, people, most of them, you know, have a hard feeling facing that. But um, so in that case, the arrest of those two Canadians is retaliation. Um, I, I, for me, it's more a game, you know, a political game, because today, you know, uh, we cannot separate the political uh, factors from the Huawei uh, um, incident. And I think the Chinese government tries to put more pressure on mm. the Canadian and American uh, governments, if this can be helpful to help fix the issues between three parties, then it's good because I don't want to see that escalation of the conflicts of three, you know, between three countries is not good for the Chinese people, ni for Canadian people, ni for the U American people. All right, well, joining us now in our conversation is Scott Moore. He's the director of the Future Ch of China Project at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for being with us from Philadelphia. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you you penned uh, um, an op-ed piece in the Washington Post where uh, you highlighted the fact that you have these two giants, right, the United States and China, and uh, there are third parties who are going to get hurt. That That's right. So I think just to take kind of a half step back and to address what uh, some of the other commentators uh, on this program have been saying, uh, the information that we have so far, to me, uh, indicates that uh, this is a legitimate uh, case. There are serious accusations against uh, Meng Wanzhou on uh, sanctions-related uh, issues, and that uh, this was an action that was pursued primarily by the U.S. Department of Justice pursuant to 
uh, longstanding extradition and law enforcement cooperation agreements uh, with Canada. Uh, and in one sense, I think that does speak well of uh, uh, sort of the, the rule of law and the, the record of cooperation between the United States and Canada. On the other hand, as Professor Mitter pointed out, uh, this is an inherently political issue. This is not like any other uh, criminal case. Uh, and Huawei, Huawei is, is not, not an ordinary uh, Chinese company. Yeah, Huawei is not an ordinary Chinese company. Explain that. Uh, absolutely not. It, it is a national champion. This is a, uh, a very high-profile company that has received lots uh, of formal and informal uh, backing from uh, the Chinese government uh, and is really viewed as a symbol uh, of China's uh, modernization uh, and its economic globalization. Uh, so this is not an ordinary company, nor is uh, Sabrina uh, Meng Wanzhou uh, an ordinary uh, executive of uh, uh, a Chinese corporate executive. She is uh, very, uh, very much a member of the Chinese elite. And those two factors make this inherently uh, a political issue. Uh, in a normal U.S. administration, an action like this to the Department of Justice would have been closely coordinated with other elements of the national security bureaucracy. There would have been extensive outreach to both China and Canada to explain the circumstances uh, of this extradition request and to try to mitigate the political fallout. It seems pretty clear to me that not, uh, none of those things happened in this case. And that is, I think, uh, what leaves us in the, uh, the dramatic and contentious situation uh, that we're now in. Let me ask uh, Rana Mitter about this, because uh, Huawei uh, is a company that, uh, who at the start, it's Chinese military intelligence that gives it its boost. Is it any different from, say, IBM and Xerox after World War II, which get big uh, defense contracts from uh, the United States government? Uh, or is Huawei really different? or indeed Boeing, which would be in that category as well during the Cold War. I think it is different. I mean, um, Professor Moore is absolutely right that Huawei is a pretty exceptional company, even by Chinese standards. And biographies of Run Zhengfei, who is Meng Wanzhou's father and the founder of uh, Huawei and a former officer of the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese army, sit, you know, piled high in bookstores in Beijing and Hong Kong, because he's become kind of a business icon in his own right. But in terms of the company itself, I think one can argue that in one sense, there isn't a difference between that uh, what President Eisenhower back in the 50s called the military industrial complex in the Cold War United States and what's happening with Huawei now. That's precisely the point. What nobody has ever managed to work out so far is how far today Huawei technology and Huawei's um, senior officials, senior business people, are still connected to the PLA. Now, the fact is that in very few, if any, cases can you find specific examples of where Huawei has actually passed on information or intellectual property to the Chinese army. The fear that lots of governments have, including Australia, New Zealand, the United States, even the UK, is that that has that potential in the future and that Huawei is very well equipped to pass on that sort of information if it chose to do so. So in that sense, I think the comparison with the Cold War American defense oriented companies is quite a good one. But the point is that at that time, there really was a connection with the defense establishment in the US. And there are perfectly decent reasons to assume that that connection exists in uh, between China, uh, China's military and Huawei today, even though it's hard to actually pin it down to the specifics. All right. And, and the uh, some companies taking no chances uh, in the UK, uh, regulators restricting access to 3G and 4G networks. Uh, it's now come to light that intelligence services and you mentioned those nations of the so-called Five Eyes Network, uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK and the US flagging um, a security risk when it came to Huawei back in July. Last Thursday here in France, the boss of phone giant Orange said he was steering clear of using Huawei in its 5G network. Stéphane Richard telling BFM Business Radio, well, kind of hedging his bets. On the one hand, telling, uh, uh, they're saying there's the fantasy in the sense that they're Chinese, that they're spies, but there is also the principle of precaution. And using that principle of precaution, um, he's steering clear of using Huawei on, on uh, 3G and 4G networks for Orange. Uh, 
let's uh, turn now to Philippe Lecor, uh, who joins us from Harvard uh, University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Philippe, uh, thank you for being with us in the France 24 debate. Uh, is Huawei really a security risk? Well, Huawei, you know, obviously uh, claims to be a private company with owned by, by, by its um, staff members. Uh, but it is obviously operating in a very sensitive area, which is telecommunications and data. Um, so what's, what it's doing really is not, not just the device that you can find uh, on the high streets, but also, you know, core networks, core technologies. And that's where, you know, um, in the current situation where, you know, digital matters are so important, um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a critical decision for governments and for intelligence uh, uh, agencies to, to make, whether to allow uh, a company like Huawei or, or even ZTE to, to, to be able to, to bid for uh, government contracts or, or contracts with major companies. And I think the decision uh, by, by Orange particularly, but also Deutsche Telekom, I understand, to uh, restrict um, uh, the use of, uh, of Huawei technologies for the core networks is a, is a good one. Is a, is a, you know, it, it makes sense. Is it any different from when you know, we, we have revelations that uh, the Americans spy or that the French spy and use telecommunications equipment? Well, um, I mean, first of all, um, uh, there, there's a problem with Huawei, which is it's a company that's been supported by the Chinese state for many years. Uh, it, it is now one of the leaders of, of this uh, technology and certainly of 5G. But it has achieved that, that situation thanks to massive state subsidies from the Chinese state, uh, particularly, you know, in Europe, uh, there are evidence of that. The European Commission has uh, published reports on this. Um, and, you know, so there are links between Huawei and the, the People's Liberation Army with the Chinese government. Uh, it's not necessarily the case with the, the American companies you mentioned, although, of course... Or there, even there a historic operator of... like, like uh, France Telecom is now Orange here in France. Right. So, so Orange is, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it used to be a state-owned company. But, you know, the, the question is, uh, there, there, are, you know, there are all kinds of <laughs> dimensions here, including, you know, the values uh, we advocate for and uh, whether we want to have our data being used by a company that, that has not uh, given clear, um, a clear picture of what it stands for and what, what, what the, the regime it, it works for stands for. We just had a few days ago, um, Chun Yan, the, 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 the um, uh, revelation now that he's uh, moving out of the limelight from Jack Ma that, yes, of course, I'm a member of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> Do you take Philippe Lecor's point about how um, there is too much of a symbiotic relationship between business leaders and uh, the state apparatus in China? Yeah, I think... Uh um, this is one point on which the Westerners have much fear, generally speaking. So on the on one hand, I agree that we should keep uh, some precautions, you know, uh, in the West. Uh, but on the other hand, I think sometimes we have too uh, much worries because Huawei, as mentioned, is a private company. And uh, Huawei has been developing very fast in the technology. If the company has decided to enter into the international market, if there are really very serious security issues at the end of one time, the company will fail. I mean, on the international market, it should follow the international competition uh, rules in, in other countries. So this reminded me about one article uh, in, in, last, uh, in, in October about Chinese uh, uh, spy chips, you know, um, used uh, in, in the... By Bloomberg. Yeah, right. Uh, which, was, which was later dismissed. Yeah, time. right. Dismissed by Apple and by Amazon uh, Web Services. So I think we tend to uh, din um, tend to din uh, demonize, sorry, demonize, um, demonize uh, Huawei in many cases. And um, All right, we're going to pick up on that point when we come back. We have to take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate on the eve 
of a major speech by China's president to mark the 40th anniversary of the country opening up its economy. And it comes in the midst of the spat over Huawei and questions over the terms and conditions of doing business with China. We're talking about it with Rana Mitter, director of Oxford University's China Center. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to Philippe Le Col, senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center, who joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we're also in the company of Scott Moore, the director of the Future of China Project at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And here in the studio, Chun Yan Li, the author of Succeeding in the Chinese Market, founder of Theta uh, Consulting. Uh, Chun Yan, just before the break, talking about, well, uh, now that it's an international player, and uh, I'll put it to you, uh, Scott Moore, now that uh, Huawei is an international player, uh, it's got a reputation if it wants people to buy its uh, equipment, and so it can't afford uh, to be too closely linked to the People's Liberation Army or to the security apparatus. Your thoughts? Well, I think that certainly is uh, the right framing of the kind of dilemma that uh, Huawei, and, and by the way, not just Huawei, but uh, many Chinese firms who are uh, sort of playing in uh, technological spaces that are considered sensitive, uh, have to try to navigate. Uh, on the one hand, many of these technologies are quite sensitive. They, they uh, sort of um, uh, are, are inherently tied to uh, issues that are uh, many Western countries view as kind of core national security considerations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the nature of uh, politics and the economy in China is such that uh, there is very rarely a case where a major global, uh, globally exporting uh, company is, doesn't have close ties to uh, the, uh, the government, the Communist Party, and the, the security services in the military. Uh, so it is a kind of legitimate uh, fear and issue. I think the one other point that I would make, though, uh, is that this is a question that is of much greater uh, concern and debate in uh, several of the Western countries, particularly the Five Eyes uh, intelligence sharing partners, uh, than it is in other countries. And if we, if we sort of broaden our focus to look at uh, many developing countries across Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, Asia, many of these concerns are a lot less salient, uh, and many states and governments would be happy uh, to, uh, uh, to have companies like Huawei play a greater role uh, in improving uh, connectivity and access to information technology. Ron Bitter, let, let's take the long view on all of this. 40 years it will be on December 18th since Deng Xiaoping announced the opening up of China's economy. Uh, are you, is this the way that you thought things would go? I have to say that I did not, like many observers, foresee quite how far and quite how fast China would develop over this time. I first started studying China maybe 30 years ago as an undergraduate at a time when actually things looked like they were almost going the other way. 1989, Tiananmen Square, the horrific killings of protesters in the center of Beijing. These were the images that really shaped the China that I grew up with as a student. And so for it to get from that, for good or ill, to where it is today, the second biggest economy in the world, a place which is at the cutting edge of economic development and technology, is really a great change. And Huawei actually, you know, in the longer perspective, is a very good example of the unexpected but very important direction that China has gone. One of the reasons that we're having this debate in the first place, and it's worth saying this because I think nobody has quite pointed out yet, is that there is a reason that the debate is so strong about Huawei. The technology they have is really, really good. They, it is much cheaper than many of the uh, competitors in the, the West. It is, of course, very efficient at what it does. And that's the dilemma that China has put forward to many places in the West and elsewhere. Do you really want to give up the chance of having this very good value, very effective system because you're worried about the politics? I don't think anyone would have looked at the China of 1978, less than 10 years out of the Cultural Revolution, a place that was primarily agricultural in its economy, a place that was a tiny proportion of world GDP and have seen the lengths that it's come in the past 40 years. It's done so at a great cost in terms of human rights, in terms of the way in which it's still regarded with great suspicion by many other actors in the world. But there's no doubt that in the last 40 years, China has become a power to reckon with in a way that people didn't really expect, I think, 40 years ago.
and they make quality stuff and uh, doing business with them is profitable. Over the weekend, the New York Times published an expose about management consultants McKinsey. Now, the story was illustrated by Instagram photos of guests at a retreat earlier this year in Kashgar. That's the ancient Silk Road city in China's uh, far west. Uh, China's uh, there, there were images of, of about four miles from where the McKinsey consultants discussed their work, which includes advising some of China's most important state-owned companies. A sprawling internment camp had sprung up to hold thousands of ethnic Uyghurs. And uh, Philippe Lecor, uh, it, it was interesting reading that piece, a reminder that uh, the same Western tech giants that are rivaling the likes of Huawei also want to do business with them. Is this a moment of reckoning we're witnessing? Well, everybody wants to do business with China, and everybody has already uh, started making business with China for 40 years, as Rana Mitter just said. Uh, and, you know, it started with the, the open-door policy of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, the problem is we are not at a, at a tipping point where uh, uh, many, many sectors in China are not open to foreign players. And when at the same time you have Chinese companies, including Huawei, but Huawei has not created that many jobs uh, in the West, for example, uh, and including many other players, they want to invest. And I'm thinking mainly of state-owned enterprises and in, in, in infrastructures particularly. But they want to, to, to have an open access to, to Western markets, in fact, to the world markets, not just the West, and with government support and support from uh, financial institutions from China. So the problem is that this question of reciprocity has not been sorted. And the ultimately, that, that ultimately, that do, ultimately, does the, do, do the human rights matter? Does the, the internment of a, a million people matter? Well, I think you should ask McKinsey, but obviously they, they've, they've already given the answer by, by doing exactly what you described in, in Xinjiang. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe many uh, foreign dignitaries, when they visit China, do address this question. I mean, again, Rana Mitter was talking about uh, 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square uh, crackdown. I don't, I don't believe many leaders dare to talk about that. I don't believe many uh, Muslim country uh, leaders are addressing the question of, of the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. So, you know, it, it, it should certainly be taken into account when we, you address the China question today, 40 years after the, uh, the, the start of the open door policy. It's not just about an open economy. It's also about a, a very repressive, repressive regime. And, and certainly the Xinjiang issue should not be being, uh, being overlooked. Scott Moore, ultimately, for being very callous and cynical, What's going on in, in, in China's far west doesn't matter? I, I think it absolutely matters. Uh, I think it, it, it is a question of principle that you do have to uh, stand on, I think, in, at, at, some, um, at some level for Western countries. The, these are uh, affronts to, I think, what, what most anybody would agree are core values. Uh, I think when you kind of take it, though, to... Um, uh, to looking at specific technologies or to the specific case of what role uh, Huawei should have in, um, uh, in markets outside China. Uh, it's, we need more of a, of a debate and, and more transparency on what exactly uh, Huawei's role is in developing and particularly exporting uh, surveillance technologies of the kind used in Xinjiang. I think in many ways the most concerning uh, aspect of this would be if uh, Huawei and, and companies like it are participating in essentially exporting uh, the policy of pervasive surveillance uh, and providing governments across the world uh, with the tools to do that. I think that's in many ways the most concerning uh, uh, potential outcome and the thing that, that we ought to be most focused on in the debate, but separately from that, you know, I think what's going on in uh, and, and, and just let me ask you on that uh, on that point, atrocious. Scott. On, on that point, Scott, where you yeah. are in the United States, is it a debate the 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 U.S. tech giants who to penetrate the Chinese market are ready to bend to the uh, censorship rules of their hosts? Well, uh, I think many companies have uh, appeared to have made uh, some type of. Uh, uh, some type of calculation in, in that respect, yes. Uh, I'm not sure that I would, uh, I would necessarily agree with, uh, with that stance. I do think that uh, 
that tech companies do have some responsibility uh, to protect their users from uh, surveillance, from exploitation, from tracking uh, that can endanger them. Uh, and I think it's not clear to me, although part of the issue is there's not a lot of transparency around what types of agreements uh, U.S. tech firms uh, might have struck with uh, the Chinese government in return for access. But I do think uh, there, there certainly needs to be uh, a more kind of public, uh, public accounting of, of what those trade-offs look like. And I do think there is a responsibility at some level for American firms who operate in China. All right. Uh, Scott Moore mentioning earlier how uh, third-party countries uh, also uh, are recalibrating of late. This Monday, uh, we saw in New Delhi, India's prime minister welcomed the new president of the Maldives. There, Narendra Modi pledged $1.4 billion in financial assistance after the previous pro-Beijing leadership uh, in uh, that tiny archipelago found itself crippled with debt from a Chinese building spree. The new president, Mohammed Ibrahim Soli, who was in opposition during what was a five-year construction boom that saw China build a sea bridge connecting, connecting the capital to the main airport, which it's developing. Narendra Modi uh, saying he's going to keep a close eye on things. Our countries share a similar interest in upholding security. We are also both of the same view that we must remain alert about each other's interests and concerns, so as to ensure stability throughout the region. At the same time, we will not allow each other's territories to be used for any activity that can be harmful to our interests. Rana Mitter, uh, your, your reaction to, to, to the words of India's prime minister? I think this is one of the most interesting geopolitical shifts that's happening anywhere in the world at the moment, which is the way that the Indian Ocean region is becoming a place for the new great game, the diplomatic maneuvering and military maneuvering between China and India. So the Maldives, which has moved from a place that's oriented towards Beijing to one that's more oriented towards New Delhi, is one example of a much bigger phenomenon. Essentially, there are two things going on. One is the Chinese BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, sometimes called the New Silk Road, is beginning to look a little bit tarnished in many places. In the Sri huge Lanka amounts as well. of infrastructure. And Sri Lanka too, also in Laos, in Malaysia, the huge amounts of infrastructure that China has pledged to actually pay for or support turns out not to be a free gift, but in fact actually a debt, which often has very high interest rates. And the other side, of course, is the clash between the navies, not yet a military clash, but a clash of build-up. The Chinese PLA Navy is now able to project across the Indian Ocean. It has its own military base in Djibouti in East Africa, and the Indian Navy is responding. So states like the Maldives, which sit right in the Indian Ocean, are now the front line of that new rivalry between an India that is concerned and alarmed. It may be surrounded by Chinese influence states and a Chinese state, which is trying to create influence in the Indian Ocean region, but may find that its own debt diplomacy, the gifts it gives, which have this very unfortunate financial effect on the countries that take it, is actually bringing its reputation down rather than up. Yeah, so there's uh, the, the tension, which is political, which, as you describe, is military, Rana Mitter. Uh, and yet, with India, you could say the same thing as with the United States. The, the two countries, are, are China and India, are rivals, but they do business together. This is not the same as during the Cold War. But Oh, a very long way from that. It's quite true that although New Delhi and Beijing, the capital cities for politics, have a quite cold relationship, Mumbai and Shanghai, the two great commercial centers, have extremely strong relationships with uh, each other. And that includes in areas such as technological development, in fact, and the selling of electronics and so forth. The fact is that China and India are two very, very fast-growing economies, not as fast as was the case just a few years ago, because there's been both global economic slowdown, actually, and a change in China's demographics. But the fact is that these are the two largest markets in Asia, and they have a tremendous amount of traffic with each other. So it's certainly the case that the economic side of the relationship will continue to grow. But that doesn't mean that the military side, the tension between those two, is necessarily to be ignored. The fact is that Europe 
traded with you know, European countries traded with each other before the First World War very effectively, but the political side still led to a deadly conflict. I'm not suggesting that sort of conflict is likely in Asia, but the economic side doesn't make a military confrontation impossible. Philippe Lecourt, which should we worry about more? A uh military standoff between uh, China and India or the trade war that's brewing between the U.S. and Beijing? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I, I do uh, realize there are, you know, economic links between uh, Mumbai and Shanghai. But the last time I tried to fly from Mumbai to Shanghai, there was no direct flight. So, there, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, uh, practicality. It, it's a complicated relationship, to, to, to say the least. Um, on, on top of it, I mean, yes, the, the U.S.-China relationship is critical at the moment because, as, as you know, there's some kind of a consensus from the, from, from the Washington point of view between Democrats and Republicans. We're going to have a Republican Congress, uh, sorry, a new Congress. U.S. Congress starting in a few weeks and, and with a majority of Democrats in the House of Representatives. Now, they are not particularly keen on, 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 on compromising with, with Beijing. Uh, this will have, you know, a, a strong impact on the economic relationship. Now, of course, Donald Trump occasionally talks about, you know, uh, striking a deal with, with China, but, but you know, this 90-day deal that we, we are going through at the moment doesn't seem to, to lead uh, very far. So I think the, you know, the world is sort of waiting for this relationship to improve, but it's going to take a very long time. And meanwhile, uh, other places, including India, including Europe, have to uh, find their space. And, and, and China uh, is very keen to uh, develop relations with others than the, the, the United States. So that's where the Indian Ocean is an interesting uh, scenario. But I would say the whole of the European continent is also uh, a, a critical area with, with weaker spots, including in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, where China has been investing dramatically, uh, while the, the larger countries like Germany and France have been more, somewhat more reluctant to welcome more uh, Chinese investments. Just over the, the weekend, Germany decided to, to uh, restrict uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the threshold of foreign investments into Germany to, for technology companies. So, you know, there, there is actually a, a, a kind of consensus across the Atlantic as well on this. Yeah, and it brings us, we've gone full circle here, Chun Yan Li, because yeah. we're talking about technology companies okay. again. Okay. Because microchips, uh, who controls uh, uh, what is the, uh, we're entering the digital age with capitalism. And it really feels as though, at the same time, it's where there's an intense rivalry and there are partnerships, right? So yeah. should we be worried or not too worried when we see Donald Trump and, and yes. Xi Jinping facing off over trade? Yeah. Um, OK, if we talk about, for example, Chinese philosophy, we can be rival, rivals, uh, competitors, but we can also be partners. You know, for example, let me take example um, of the USA and China or all the Euro Euro European countries and China. Uh, I don't think there was, uh, the relationship could be either win-win win, uh, or loss-loss. No, so we. So you're not too worried about the trade tensions. Uh, no, I, I'm. I, I think it will last still for some time, and I think the uh, China USA uh, trade war is actually is a uh, is a technology war, and for me it's something uh, we cannot really avoid, because when one new country you know is growing, 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 and the old ones they will be worrying about, they will try to do something to prevent. You know, some the new countries like uh, like China uh, from growing too fast, especially in the on the technologies. So uh, I think something that we cannot avoid. But now I expect that from the global point of view, because all the economics are interconnected. So I hope that we can really fix all the conflicts, all the you know different issues between China and the USA, and uh, we can also you know look at the Chinese investment with. Uh, um, uh, with more friendly attitude. And also, I think on the Chinese communist uh, side, they also should make more efforts to better understand the international environment, you know, the legal environment, the potential political issues, and try to be more uh, better adapted to the local environment. Yeah, I think the effort should be mutual. Yeah. 
Are, Scott Moore, you reassured that uh, Big Brother can't take over the world if it is, you know, a, 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 a fight for dominance between intelligence services, as some describe it, because, well, you have to uh, please consumers and win their trust and confidence. Well, I, I, I'm not at all uh, entirely satisfied. Uh, you know, as I, I mentioned before, I, I think there are significant concerns over the prospect of, uh, of exporting pervasive surveillance technologies. But I think you have to look at all of these things in a bigger context. You know, I think if we were to sort of summarize our conversation uh, today, we've talked about technology, but we've also talked about trade and economics, and then we've talked about politics and security. Uh, on and those three things uh, are, um, you know, frankly, sort of involve different balances of the costs and benefits of integration, uh, trade, and free exchange of people and ideas. I think on the, the political and security side, there is some uh, rationale for uh, for enforcing some controls and limits. But on the other hand, you know, nobody. Uh, well, let me put it this way: uh, the research is pretty clear that if we try to wall off technological development. Uh, and trade, it makes everyone worse off. Uh, there really aren't any uh, mm -hmm. winners in that scenario. And so I think that the question has to be, uh, how do we sort of balance uh, legitimate concerns and considerations uh, relating to China's rise and particularly core values around democracy, human rights, et cetera? But how do we uh, address those concerns in a responsible way that doesn't set us on the course uh, to some type of new, uh, new Cold War? Scott Moore in Philadelphia, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank uh, as well Philippe Lecor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Rana Mitter for being with us from Oxford, Chun Yan Lee. Stay with us. Media Watch is next.